Welcome everybody. This is a Hungry for Melod with uh, my Superbot and my friend Avinash. We will be talking about the next letter in our series of Buffett partnerships and uh, we'll be covering the first half of 1962 in this video. Cannot wait. And before we get started, uh, Avinash will talk about some of the some of the things that were going on around the world and in America at that time. All right, here we go. Awesome. 1962. Let's see what's going on. Okay, so um, 1962. Okay, so Buffett is 32 years old. So in the ether of 1962, or in the decade of 1960s, the, what's going on is there's the Cold War. America's involved in that. There's also the space race and the Vietnam War. So U.S. involvement is still ongoing. So all these are, are kind of in the ether. In because we haven't started the Vietnam War, huh? It's about like two years away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, that's right. So we're that's still kind of, yeah. yeah, around that time, yeah. And so uh, John F. Kennedy, this is his second year as president. Um, interestingly, since, you know, I kind of grew up in New Zealand, and shout out to New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, Western Samoa, I didn't know, becomes independent. Um, from New Zealand. I didn't know that was part of uh, New Zealand before, but interestingly. Also in the States, the United States Navy SEALs, elite special forces are activated. So did not know that this happened in the 1960s. What's interesting and probably what uh, Buffett might have been interested in or would have known about, uh, or maybe not, he's still 32, you know, he's very focused on US stocks, but the Taiwan Stock Exchange Corporation opens up uh, February 9th. Um, February 14th in the White House. This is the first time television viewers are allowed to see what's in the White House. So you can see the uh, adoption of uh, televisions around, um, you know, everyone's kind of living rooms. Before that, it was all just newspaper and radio. Um, interestingly, you know, we've talked about food before on this channel and uh, different kind of food places opening up. Taco Bell opens up uh, March 21st, 1962. The first, food, the first uh, chain is opened up by Glenn Bell in California. Um, some sad news, August 5th, Mar Marilyn Monroe is found um, to be dead, overdosed on sleeping pills. September oh. 12th, yeah, I know, sad news. Um, but September 12th, on my birthday, John F. Kennedy announces that he uh, is going to put people on the moon um, by the end of the decade. So his famous speech given September 12th, It was in Houston, Rice University? I didn't know that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Super interesting. Um, so, um, you know, some, some famous people that we could probably relate to um, are just born on... We could um, relate to. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Jim Carrey and those guys <laughs> that oh, we buddy. know. <laughs> um, 1962, they're born. Um, so Jim Carrey's born same year. Sheryl Crow, the famous, you know, uh, um, country singer. John Bon Jovi, uh, Tom Cruise, and John Stewart, all born on the same year, 1962. But what's most interesting is Buffett is 32, and this is the first time that we have, um, um, you know, video uh, footage of Warren Buffett speaking. So let me kind of show you this, and hopefully you can hear it. If not, I, I encourage you to go to this website here. Uh, the stock market has been a good forecaster uh, from time to time in the past. It also has been a rather poor forecaster occasionally. For example, the last four or five years, the stock market has been booming along and uh, presumably forecasting better business, which has really not materialized. Corporate profits are, are not any better than they were five years ago, but stock prices are 50% uh, higher thereabouts. Uh, so maybe the stock market is really uh, correcting a previous incorrect forecast this time rather than making a new correct one. Well, there was uh, undoubtedly some force selling the, uh, the week uh, when the stock market hit the news. The previous week, uh, prices had declined about 6% for the week on average. And uh, there was some stock that uh, was forced upon the market, both by margin calls from brokers and uh, uh, some that was uh, forced out by in, in improperly uh, secured bank loans. Interesting. Uh, Prav, were you able to hear uh, the that? The stock market has been a good forecaster. Uh, were, were you able to hear that? So that's him at 32. So I actually didn't hear it in the. Oh, you so didn't. Okay. It was just okay. To the... No worries. Um, but yeah, so that that's kind of what what he's going through, and uh, I know probably you've heard um, his, uh, you know, him talking at the age of thirty two, and he's very eloquent. Maybe you know we'll take a little pause to talk about how eloquent he really is. He kind of reminds me of like a young Obama back in the day. 
did you i agree i mean this yeah. is so sharp and he just um and you know it's like spitting out wisdom you know this this is still yeah. a young 32 year old dude and uh and and the interesting thing is i feel like his philosophies have not changed right at all like i mean you can right. listen to his uh, like the oldest or most most recent speeches like at the age of 90 and it's the same thing yeah yeah and he's, yeah, he's, yeah. and you know one thing that i wanted to add is you know he's very self-deprecating if you look at his interviews now he's saying oh you know i was really bad at public speaking and oh you know i had to take this dale carnegie course and that's yeah. how i got the guts to like go off in front of people and stuff and then you hear him at 32 and you're like oh my god this guy's like a natural born uh orator and he just knows it's a good question because when did he take that course that maybe he already took it i'm he not sure. definitely already took it because he's already married um and i know that uh, when he took the first dale carnegie course that was when he got the courage to ask uh, his wife to marry him oh right Dude, yeah. he got married at 21 so he, he must have taken his late teenage years then that's right the course then. yeah so this is like post him teaching and stuff like that so uh he's pretty eloquent wow. at 32 yeah so no, incredible I, I mean he uh, he could have run for president but he would be not as rich yeah and he would have hated his job <laughs> i think he's great yeah. at what he does yeah capital yeah. allocation he's smart smart yeah. dude knows yeah. what he wants um, but at? you know um maybe we could do a quick recap of what happened in the the past year so 1960 do you want to maybe take us just a sure. brief glimpse i will of where try we're... to do uh in 1961 yep um he talks about uh this is some of the notes i took i think from the second letter from 1962 i think the first letter he just kind of talks about his partnerships and kind of business stuff but he kind of breaks down in the last letter that he has basically three categories of stocks he's looking at uh the first one where he has the most profits from he calls the generals and these are kind of the general undervalued stock plays and he doesn't take an active role he buys it and sells it when the market has you know corrected the mispricing to say and you know he just buys cheap sells for higher than he bought it for he makes few bets five to ten bet five to six bets and you know taking five to ten percent of his portfolio and then he also has some some lower conviction bets i think that are that are prob probably perceived as more risky mm -hmm. um but yeah like i said most of his profits were from this uh, group of um, stocks, and and these were not the, those illiquid stocks necessarily. These stocks did move with the market up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, second category talked about was the spinoffs and the workouts, which you know follow a timeline, a, a corporate uh, timeline, the mergers and acquisitions and spinoffs. And he had about uh, ten. He would expect about ten to twenty percent return that he could, for sure count on to the point that he was willing to borrow money to play these stocks and after 25 percent of his entire portfolio he was put as collateral for that mm. and these because they're there the stock market wasn't driven by market uh happenings they actually went by corporate uh the uh, things that were happening in, in the corporate world um so so he felt better because he wouldn't like uh, a decrease in stock market wouldn't necessarily take the stock down with it mm -hmm. and the last was the control one where where he would slower long period of time slowly build a big position and and kind of play an active investor role and and cause unlock of value possibly guess resulting in you know spin-offs or or restructuring deals where where you know money will be his hit he would his stock will go up and then he he still is not holding everything for a very long time, is yeah. my understanding. Right. And then he talks about how he's conservative. He's going to this huge lecture about he is very conservative and he all he does not want to lose money. And what he's doing is the safest thing he can do from his point of view. And it is safer than buying bonds. It is safer than buying blue chip stocks that have higher multiple you know, just the the super expensive blue chip stocks that everybody's buying, mm -hmm. which is super relatable to today's market. Yep. So, so I think yeah. um, that's just very interesting. That you know, everybody's like, "Oh, you're a stock picker. You you're taking risks. Let's just buy the index and and that that does work. Index yeah. investing does yeah. work." Yeah. But 
this way, the, the picking of, you know, finding those values is less risky. Mm -hmm. I don't even care about the upside. Just the downside is, is, is minimal. Yep. That's right. So. Yeah. So that, that's a good summary. So um, three main things that he covered was, uh, you know, undervalued stock. That's how he's thinking about it. The other one is spinoffs. And then the third one is um, gaining much uh, control, some control of the company. So those are the three things. And then also in, in um, you know, what, kind of what's going on in the stock market the past five years, it's been doing really well. So reminds you of what's going on today. And then, you know, history tends to repeat itself. So maybe we can take away some good things in this letter. So um, maybe we could started on 1961's letter yes and uh, I will also like to point this out here if, if you'll let me share my screen I'd like to show yeah uh, this is from later in the year of 1962 since we're trying to do everything 1962 related yep I'm maybe jumping again a little bit but kind of tells you all the stocks that that uh, Buffett had bought in this year. Uh, and here we go. Oh, interesting. Oh, how neat. I don't so know if the, you guys can see it. I, I can see it, but um, so okay. On the let's... top it says, and we'll put a link, uh, you know, but it says Buffett Partnership Limited. December 31st, 1962, mm -hmm. first year, um, I think when he buys BRK, first purchase Berkshire. And over here you see this, he's bought wow. uh, some of the Berkshire for his partnership. And Interesting. he's got some other names as well that I don't recognize in this cursive handwriting. Wow. And this is for $7. And I guess nine sixteenth. I don't do fractions. Yeah. And he has looks like put in about two hundred thirty four thousand dollars into this mm. textile business. Interesting. Wow. Very fascinating. What a cool look into how it used to be <laughs> how it used to be done. But it is kind of funny because um, we never think of you know he's pretty meticulous. You can tell because you know this yeah. is all he does, right? So he's writing. Remember he's talked down. about that Dempster company. Yeah. It's uh the illiquid stock in i think in nebraska and this yeah. is where you see this uh, the, his portfolio is worth about 2.2 .2 million dollars from from that wow company. incredible it's alphabetical actually like oh, no this dude is ocd yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and and where's that mapping company was that the same one i think he had sold off that the oh, mapping company okay. sam yes maybe he had not actually that's a good question Stay, stay, may, yeah, that one? Maybe stay something there. Yeah. It's not staying rock, stranger coal. Oh, good thing you can read the handwriting. That's how I know you're a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I can't read it, actually. Okay. It's, it's like Samson Map or something. Very cool. I think you may still be holding it, though, based on the Wikipedia article. Wow, what a great find. Um, where were you able to find this? On Twitter, it was just making oh, no us kidding. round around Twitter. That's awesome. Very cool. It's incredible. Okay, incredible. let's see what's happening. Nineteen sixty-two. Yes, I've unshared and okay. pull up Let the letter when you see it. Perfect. I see it. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Um, this is letter is the first half of 1962, written in July of that year, and here we go. Starts with a reminder. In my letter of January 24, 1962, reporting on 1961, I inserted a section titled, And a Prediction. While I have no desire to inflict cruel and unusual punishment upon my readers, nevertheless, a reprinting of that section in its entirety may be worthwhile. <laughs> wow, there we go. It's a funny guy. And a prediction, and we'll just read over it again, just because he wants us to. Regular readers, I may be flattering myself, will feel I have left the tracks when I start talking about predictions. This is one thing from which I have always shied away, and I still do in the normal sense. I'm certainly not going to predict what general business or the stock market are going to do in the next year or two, since I don't have the faintest idea. I 
think you can be quite sure that over the next 10 years, there are going to be a few years when the journal market is plus 20% or 25%, a few when it's in minus in the same order, and a majority when it is in between. I haven't any notion as to the sequence in which this will occur, nor do I think it is on any great importance for the long-term investor. Over the long period of years, I think it's likely that the Dow will probably produce something like 5 to 7% per year compounded from a combination of dividends and market value gain. Despite the experience of recent years, anyone expecting substantially better than that from the general market probably faces disappointment. Our job is to pile up yearly advantages over the performance of the Dow without worrying too much about whether the absolute results in a given year are a plus or a minus. I would consider a year in which we were down 15% of the Dow declined 25% to be a much superior to a year when both the partnership and the Dow advanced 20%. I have stressed this point in talking with partners and have watched them nod their heads with varying degree of enthusiasm. It is most important to me that you fully understand my reasoning in this regard and agree with me not only in your cerebral regions, but also down in the pit of your stomach. <laughs> For the reasons outlined in my method of operation, our best years relatively to the Dow are likely to be in the declining or static markets. Therefore, the advantage we seek will probably come in sharply varying amounts. There are bound to be years when we are surpassed by the Dow, and if we, over a long period of time, we can average 10% uh, points per year better than it, I will feel the results have been satisfactory. Specifically, if the market should be down 35 or 40 percent in a year, and I feel this is a high probability of occurring in one year in the next 10, no one knows which one, we should be down only 15 to 20 percent. If it is more or less unchanged during the year, we would hope to be up about 10 percent point, percentage points. If it is up 20 percent or more, we would struggle to be up as much. The, sub, the consequence of performance such as this over a period of years would mean that if the Dow produces 5 to 7% per year, overall gain compounded, I would hope our results might be 15% to 17 per year. The above expectation may sound somewhat rash, and there is no question but that they may appear very much so when we from the vantage point of 1965 to 1970, it may turn out that I am completely wrong. However, I feel the partners are certainly entitled to know what I'm thinking in this regard, even though the nature of the business is so as to introduce a high probability of error in such expectations. In any one year, the variation may be quite substantial. This happened in 1961, but fortunately the variation was on the pleasant side they won't all be okay again I mean a quick summary he's like I've done great in the past five years lower your expectations and judge me in the down market or static market I should do better than the Dow mm -hmm. and uh, if it's you know if the Dow does a little bit better I may still do better but the Dow does ridiculously better then you know I will struggle but yep. over a long period of time, there'll be all, a lot of ups and downs, but Dow should do 5 to 7% annually on average, including the dividends, and I hope to beat it by another 10%. Yeah. That is right. his goal for himself. Yeah. And I think it, it goes back to, so the video clip um, uh, um, that I just referenced, that also says, you know, he says something really important in that in that video, which talks about exactly this, where he says, look, the past five years, the economy is booming. But when you really look at the business, they're not doing anything different than they were doing five years ago. So that's a great right. way to think about a business where you're saying, hey, look, are they really worth this much? Is it really, you know, are they, are they doing something drastically different than what they were doing five years ago? So, you know, he's saying, guys, this is a great market, but I'm telling you, you sure your expectations should be very low. Oh, I agree. Oh, I agree. Um, but he always says that. So yeah, who cares? that's true. <laughs> <laughs> the first half of 1962. Between year end 1961 and June 30th, 1962, the Dow declined from 731 to 561. That's a big drop. 
Mm. If one had owned the Dow during this period, dividends on of approximately eleven dollars would have been received, so that overall a loss of twenty one percent would have been the result of investing in the Dow. For the statistical minded, Appendix A gives the results of the Dow by years since formation of the predecessor partnerships. As stated above, a declining Dow gives us a chance to shine and pile up the percentage advantages, which, coupled with only an average performance during advancing markets, will give us a quite satisfactory long term results. Our target is an approximately half percent decline for each one percent decline in the Dow, and if achieved, means we have considerably more conservative vehicle for investment in stocks than practically any alternative. As outlined in Appendix B, showing combined predecessor partnerships results during the first half of 1962, we had one of the best periods in our history, achieving a minus 7.5% result before payment to partners, compared to the minus 21% overall results on the Dow. Oh, wow. He had his first mm. minus here. Interesting. <laughs> this 14% points advantage can be expected to widen during the second half of if the decline in the general market continues, but will probably narrow should the market turn upwards. Please keep in mind my continuing admonition uh, that six months or even a year's results are not to be taken too seriously. Short periods of measurement exaggerate chance fluctuations in performance, while uh, circumstances contributed to an unusually good first half, there are bound to be periods when we do relatively poorly. The figures for our performance involve no change in the valuation of our controlling interest in Dempster Mill Manufacturing Company, although development in recent months points towards a probable higher realization. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So let's Thomas take a break and, and maybe just talk about uh, this down year that he's had. So up till now, until 1961, he's pretty much, you know, outperformed the market here. But 1962, this is his first down year. And he's... Well, he, is, he has continued to outperform the market almost every year. I feel like every year. Um, even when Dow was negative, he has been positive. He's never really had a negative year. Yeah, yeah. And so he's just been killing it, but now now he's the facing first, the first the the first negative year. So at least first negative six months since we don't know what the second half will do. Yeah. So let's let's maybe talk about that. So so in the market, um, right now it's super bullish, so everyone's making money if they were just to put it into the Dow. But then mm -hmm. um, if you were to put it in Buffett's partnership, then you would be down compared to that. But then um, I guess it should make sense, right? Because he's saying, hey, look, when it's super bullish, um, you know, we should be making um, we should be making less money. But then when it's bearish, we should be making more money. But this is not the case here, right? What do you mean? He is. He's so, saying he, his losses are just not as bad. He's saying for every, like, that, that was down, like, 20%. He's saying we should be down 10%, not 20%. So oh, we should saying, be okay. less down. We should be less down than the Dow, and he's still beating his benchmark because he's only down seven point five percent. Okay, so the Dow's down twenty two percent almost, and then he's down seven point five. So overall, so this is actually a good thing, even though it's a negative year. It's less negative than the Dow. Absolutely, it's yep. a phenomenal yep. year. This this okay. is a victory for him. Gotcha. Okay, so it's actually not a bad thing. I read it as you know his first negative year. It's actually not a bad negative if you do the comparative game. And remember, Not he good. had that like uh, um, yardstick measurement of the Dow being the, the comparison. So really, he's doing pretty dang good. Perfect. perfect. Yep. Uh, next part, investment companies during the first half. Past letters have stressed our belief that the Dow is no pushover as the yardstick for investment performance. To extent that uh, funds are invested in common stocks, whether the manner of investment be through investment companies, investment counselors, bank trust departments, or do it yourself. Our belief is that the overwhelming majority will achieve results roughly comparable to the Dow. Our opinion is that the deviation from the Dow are much more likely to be toward a poorer performance than a superior one. Oh my mm. God. 
he's basically in 1962 telling you you should just index. I mean, that's that's like before I think Bogle was trying to you know preach about it. Yeah. It's like mo most people will do worse if you try to beat the market. Most people will do worse. Mm -hmm. Uh, to illustrate this point, we have continually measured the Dow and limited partners results against the two large open end investment companies, mutual funds, following a program of common stock investment and the two largest closed end investment companies. The tabulation in Appendix C shows the, the five years results and you will know the figures are extraordinarily close to those of the Dow. These companies have uh, total assets of about 3.5 billion. In this interest of getting this letter out promptly, we are mailing it before results are available for the closed end companies. However, the two mutual funds both did poorer than the Dow with Massachusetts Investors Trust having a minus 23% of overall performance and the Investors Stock Fund realizing a minus 25%. This is not unusual as, as witnessed uh, uh, as witnessed the lead article in the Wall Street Journal of, of uh, June 13, 1962 headed funds versus the market of the 17 large common stock funds studied everyone had a record poor than the dow from the peak on the dow of 734 to the date of the article although in some cases the margin of inferiority is was minor hmm. particularly hard hit in the first half were the so-called growth funds which almost without exception were down considerably more than the dow the three large growth, the quotation marks are more applicable now. <laughs> <laughs> Funds with the best uh, record in the preceding few years, Fidelity Capital Fund, Putnam Growth Fund, and Wellington Equity Fund averaged an overall minus 32% for the first half. It is only fair to point out that because of their excellent records in 1959 and 61, their overall performance to date is still better than the average as it may well be in the future. Ironically, however, these earlier superior performance had caused such a rush of new investors to come to them that the poor performance this year was experienced by very many more holders than enjoyed the excellent performance of earlier years. This uh, experience tends to confirm my hypothesis that investment performances must be judged over a period of time with such a period including both advancing and declining markets there will continue to be both a point perhaps better understood now than six months ago mm. in outlining the the results of uh, investment companies i do so not because we operate in a manner comparable to them or because our investment are similar to theirs it is done because such investment represent public battling average professional highly paid investment management handling a very significant $20 billion of securities. Such management, I believe, is typical of management handling even larger sums. As an alternative to an interest in the partnership, I believe it is reasonable to assume that many partners would have investments managed similarly. Mm. Oh my God, beautiful, beautiful. So what are your thoughts about what we just read? So, um... Well, I, so, so he's saying, you know, compared to the Dow, we're doing pretty similar. I'm excited to see the index of um, what's going on, but um, to, to really see the numbers. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that's his main takeaway, right? It's just that. Yeah, I mean, he basically said, you know, Dow did this and Dow is, is great. And Dow is so hard to beat for a lot of people and yeah. a lot of mutual funds just kind of follow the Dow. And, and most will do worse than the Dow and only few will beat the market, beat the so to say. And and then he goes about, well, if you weren't in Berkshire, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. If you weren't with Buffett Partnerships and you weren't in the index, what would you be in? Let's look at all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, then he talks about how he looks at a few of the open-ended one. The, he had limited data when he put out the letter and they did similarly or worse. And the most important point is these growth funds. I mean, a, a close comparison to this would be the Kathy Woods, you know, stocks, uh, the funds of today, where the, the preceding few years, the growth funds had incredibly amazing 
outperformance, which means the average investor had fear of missing out or, or, or was greedy and got into the funds at the top. And now the funds have declined, mm -hmm. you know, much more than the, even the Dow and, and their experienced losses. And this is a psychology of, of what happens when you jump from investing approach to investment approach. You just need to pick one and stick with it. For people in this aggressive growth funds who are, who have who got in a few years ago and haven't really touched anything, they are probably doing better than the mm -hmm. index. But mm -hmm. people who are chasing high performance funds are going to have a bad time. Yeah, but right now they're having a great time. But you know, there's no telling who? when the the Who's guys are, the, the the guys who are invested in these growth. Um, You're talking about in today's market. In today's market, yeah, 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 yeah. They're they're having a blast. I mean, right. everybody's having a blast, actually. Right, but then I don't know anybody who's actually down except for me. Yeah, <laughs> but um, uh, like it, it, it goes to say, like you know, because it was this was a down year. Nineteen sixty two was a down year. Then you know, there's no real prediction. It seems like um, to really predict when it was going to go down, right? So really, it's just like um, whatever your investments are, make sure you're pretty protected on the downward cycle i think that's like a good takeaway here right yeah i mean that and that buffett video is is like so beautiful he's like you know people are asking oh you know the the market's down declining what's going on it's like well i don't know if it's some um, something has changed today but it may just be correction of of the prior enthusiasm and uh and i think we should end this video whenever we do with that with that clip Mm -hmm. Like, you know, at the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Asset values. The above calculations of results are before allocation to the general part uh, partners and monthly payments to partners. Of course, whenever the overall results for the year are not plus 6% on the market value basis, with the deficiencies carried forward, there is no allocation to the general partner. Therefore, not withdrawing partners have had a decrease in their market value equity during the first six months of about 7.5%. And the partners who have withdrawn at rate of 6% per annum have, have a decrease in their market value equity during the first half of 10.5%. Should our result for the year be uh, less than plus 6%, and unless there uh, should be um, material advanced in the Dow, this is very probable, partners receiving monthly payments will have a decrease in their market value equity at December 31, 1962. This means that monthly payments at 6% on this new market equity next year will be on a proportionally reduced basis. For example, if our results we are an overall minus seven percent for the year our partner receiving monthly payments who had a market value interest of hundred thousand dollars on january 1st of 1962 would have an equity uh at december 31st 1962 of eighty seven thousand dollars this reduction would arise from the minus seven percent result or seven thousand plus monthly payments of Five hundred dollars for an additional six thousand. Does with eighty-seven thousand dollars of market equity on January first, nineteen sixty-three, monthly payments next year would be four thirty-five dollars. Hmm. So a lot of math there. Uh, I am trying to decipher it. I understand yeah. the market is down, so you have. 7% less money if if there was a liquidation if you were to sell your position but i think he is also trying to say that the monthly payments of 6% that were given out would would be affect like would also add to the to decrease in overall uh, yeah. money you have in the in the fund. Like the six percent is coming from is being charged to the investor, which I don't understand why. Maybe he's just giving examples here, but um, 
So he's saying whenever the overall results of the year is not plus 6%, um, there's no allocation to the general partner. Because remember, he has that rule where 6% he'll pay for if it's less than 6% gains. And then if it's over, then he takes. Oh, I think he has. A, I think he has a separate plan where people can get monthly six percent. Oh, I think those people okay. are affected. Because the next line said, none of the above, of course, has any applicability to advance payments received during 1962, which do not participate oh, in profit or losses, okay. but are in a straight six percent. So those people who just given his money, got the six percent till the money's invested, got ahead. I mean, that's okay. just uh, yeah. timing the market, but yeah. But okay, it doesn't doesn't. So it's just intricacies of his, his partnership. Yeah. Okay, but, now here are the appendixes. Yeah. Uh, here we have um, appendix A, the Dow average, and it goes over all the years up to the first six months of 62 as well. And uh, you can see how Dow has kind of jumped so, um, up and down, up and down. Uh, we started at 4.99 on in 56, and went as high as 7.31 at the end of 61, and now it's at 5.61. That's volatile. Yeah, it's so volatile. Um, let's. I mean, I know we're gonna come to the percentages, but let's maybe just because uh, because I want to try and understand this lart. I mean, this last column here. So this is the percentage. Um, um, you know, as as an overall percentage, what the result has been for uh, just, you know, in terms of percentage growth or loss, right? So if that's the case, then does that mean that um, there's way, there used to be way more fluctuation in the market back in 1962 than there is now? Like, it would be crazy if the stock market you, one year went negative eight and then next year it was like up 40%. I mean, do we see these same fluctuations now? I mean, the past five years we haven't, and that's the concern. Like, what is going on? It's it's is it just a crazy market? But I mean, it's it's, it's you can't say. I'm sure there have been long stretches of of just positive year on end growth. But yes, I mean, it's it's weird to see going up twenty two percent and then down twenty one percent the next day. I mean, it's, it's yeah it's next year kinda, yeah next year it's just kind of ridiculous how yeah yeah it was like going nowhere. Yeah, Basically. you know, I wonder if this is because there's less stocks on the stock market at this time. So the law of averages kind of figures it out for yourself, right? Is that is that a possibility? Yeah, or or also one could argue markets are more efficient now, so there's less mm -hmm. volatility because that'll be the other argument from the efficient market theory, and I feel like that that would be very credible as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, let's that, let's look at the percentages. This is going to be juicy. So yes, you can so see here Berkshire, compared. Oh, sorry, to, partnership performance. Yep. Uh, and then you have the total at the end, and on the right you have the limited partners, like if you had actually invested the money in, without, yeah. like after Buffett's commission. So okay. fifty-seven, they went up ten percent, or just look at partners. You know, nine point three, thirty-two, twenty. And they're basically they underperformed the the Dow on in fifty eight, mm -hmm. just by eight points. Mm -hmm. But other than that, they have beaten the Dow every year, including this year. Yeah, that's true. And right. uh, and and they're still like you know what fifteen point percent points ahead of Dow, which, which is ridiculous. I mean that is called mm -hmm. guarding your downside and mm -hmm. still having some upside. I mean. Yeah. Very asymmetric. What's interesting also is that so that in 1962, you know, they had a down year or a negative year. Um, that affects. So there's no, you know, he's not taking a cut here. You can see it's negative 7.5 loss for him is also a negative 7.5 loss for the. Partners. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, of course. Of course. Yeah. But look, look at these figures, you know, uh, in 1961, 45 percent, 46. He took 10 percent to himself. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Like eight percent in nineteen fifty eight. That's crazy. Yeah. That's I mean. But it's no pretty cool if you're if you're a limited partner. It's still pretty great that he's this transparent, right? Because who the heck would oh, share yeah. Yeah. that type of information? I mean, that's kind of insane. It is. It is amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, look here. Uh, for nineteen fifty one to sixty one, consists of uh, combined results of all 
predecessor limited partnership operating throughout the entire year after all expenses, but before distribution to partners or allocation to the general partners. And in the second column, we have uh, computer on basis of preceding co column of partnership results, allowing for allocation to general partners based upon uh, present partnership agreements. So yeah, it's just like first column is total, I think, and the second is for limited partners. Yeah. And here he comp uh, tells you about what the other guys are doing. Uh, if you weren't invested with, with Buffett, like you know, what well, you'd probably be in a mutual fund, and and they kind of did terrible, just as terrible as Dow or worse. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! Just by numbers, I mean, like it, now, if if I read this letter and I had money, like no, I would have obviously invested with Buffett. I feel like if he would take my money. Uh, yeah, but oh, in interesting here that he doesn't. Where is um, Buffett Partners in this? What, why? No, there's he, not. He's just telling yeah. you the other. Yeah, like interesting. What the other it's doing. it's kind of weird. I mean, it's pretty great to kind of get inside the mind of uh, Warren Buffett here, just because he's comparing himself not just against the Dow, really. Even mm -hmm. though he says that the yardstick is against the Dow, he he's kind of keeping an eye out on all these other guys, being like, "Well, are these guys figuring out something that I'm not?" So he's pretty, you know. He has his eye on it as well. Yeah. And uh, we will cumulative so, results. Here yeah. we go. There's what uh, you know. This is cumulative. Oh, right here. Okay. Compounded. Yep. Through you know nine hundred seven and and what that money did by the end. You know, like so limited partners. If you put money in the beginning and and now you never took money money out, you're. Up 160 percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, and you double your money and then some, you know. And the Dow, yeah. you're up 37 percent. I mean, that's that's kind of 37 percent cumulative over five years. That's not very good. Yeah, and 37 percent um, is still better. It goes back to his point about how the Dow is better than people who are stock pickers. Because you can see all the <laughs> other ones are still doing worse than the Dow. And then, of course, Buffett being the exception, uh, just killing it. Yeah. Yeah. Over five years. I mean, that's how he wants to be judged and, and judge him. I mean, what yeah. are you going to say? You can't, yeah. you can't say he, unless he had a lot of can't fight this the is all fraud or insider trading. Yeah. That's incredible. Wouldn't this, if you were an investor, wouldn't this stand out to be like, come on, man, there's something fishy going on here? with this Buffett guy, this doesn't look real. It, it's almost unreal. Yeah, maybe it's too good to be true and maybe you need to, you know, figure out who you're dealing with and, and make sure this guy's not, you know, full of crap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but once you do, I mean, you can dig around. He's like, you know, the most ethical person in terms of, you know, uh, caring for the shareholders, so. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Wow. Okay, it's like, so what, can we find a Buffett of today? Like, what if we go around, you know, reading letters from young partnerships, you know, future Buffett wannabes who is looking working with smaller capital and mm -hmm. just uh, put your energy into finding one that's doing this and give them your money or do I it mean, yourself. I I would think the only dude really emulating him to the point of. Uh, uh, laughability is probably don't say it. Prize. <laughs> uh, but he's too big now. I mean, he's looking he's at you know, hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars. I agree, but if you're wanting to, it's still chump change compared to Buffett. someone who's doing like ten million dollars. You know, he, that would be great. Someone managing ten million, leave some, leave some comments in, <laughs> in yes. this video. Yes, reach out to us. We will give you <laughs> lots of money. Exactly. If you're the next Buffett, hey man, please comment. Help us yes. out of here. <laughs> yes, yes. And then That'd tell us great. when you're going to start the next Berkshire. I will, I will you know, oh, if I had a Bitcoin, I'll sell it and, and buy your stock. <laughs> but yeah, that concludes 1962. <laughs> on the first six months. On of the first letter. Yep. Excited for the next All one. All right. See you guys on the other side of the year. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys.